Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. First of all, I want you to see something. He is urging men. Men, listen to me. Preaching is more than just you doing a fine work of exegesis. Preaching is more than just you getting the grammar right and communicating truth. Preaching is more than that. Preaching is about life and death, heaven and hell. Preaching is not just the communicating of truth, but it is urging men. It is begging men. It is pleading with men to take the truth they have been given and to live according to that. Preaching is an extremely dangerous thing for both the preacher and the hearer. It is dangerous for the preacher because if he preaches another gospel, he stands condemned. If he commits a lesser crime, and misinterprets the scripture. Whatever he builds upon that bad interpretation will be burned on the day of judgment as wood, hay, and stubble. So preaching is a dangerous thing for the preacher, but it's also a dangerous thing for the hearer. Every bit of truth that we are given, for that truth we are responsible. And so be cautious when you preach. Don't just lay that out there before men and say, this is the truth. But be like the Apostle Paul, who although Apostle demonstrates here a prophetic and a pastoral heart, he urges them, he beseeches them, he pleads with them. Every time you give them a truth, how then shall we live? You will not be judged for the amount of truth in your head, you must tell them. But the amount of truth you have lived with your life. Sometimes I go and I hear men who boast to be great expository preachers and I feel as though I've just, I've just gone through a New Testament introduction. They've told me about history and how big the city of Colossae is and all sorts of things. But I need more than just background. I need to hear a voice within a voice. I need to hear preaching. And when I hear preaching, then I need to be urged to act upon it. In this day of eloquent men, and tellers of jokes and men with whimsical personalities. We need men who see the weighty matters of truth and scripture. And when they stand up before people, they can see eternity in that man's face. They know he is a man who more than being before people is always before God. So when you preach, when you're going to tell someone truth or what they should do, you must plead with them to do it. We live in a society, a culture that is so superficial. It doesn't understand the weightier matters of eternity and life, the importance of a Godward life. And so when you come to them in the pulpit with truth, let them know this is serious. This task that you have been given, you're not to be a comedian a narrator, or just a teller of stories. You're not just to be a professor. Sometimes if we're preaching on the streets, we may see the lost multitude before us, and we might feel like Whitfield who told the crowd, if you will not weep for your own souls, then I will weep for them. There are so many things that are so easy to give away. Give away a car, give away a home, give away a meal, give away 10. All that is outside the body. All that can be done while still keeping part of our heart away from God. What God is not just merely asking of you in a gentlemanly sort of fashion. He's not just asking of you. He is commanding you that you give him yourself in its entirety. One of the purposes of cultivating godliness is cultivating Godwardness that each day as we grow, our main occupation is to give more and more of ourselves away to Him. That is one of the aspects of sanctification. Now notice here, very important for our culture, for our day, 
He says to offer yourselves, to present yourselves. This is a prophetic call. This is that prophetic word of how long will you limp between two opinions? If Baal is God, then serve him. If God is God, serve him. In the church, so many times, even in our preaching, even in our pastoral work, we seem to have become so tolerant that we give more preference to men and their feelings than we do to God. Now, we must be patient with all men as God is patient with all men. But every once in a while, the entire congregation and the individual needs to hear this for once and for all. Stop your limping between two opinions. They need to hear that word. They need to hear that call. This is not some lesser deity following men around as a servant. This is God. He demands, He deserves absolutely every part of us. And our people need to know that. That God is not in this for them primarily. He's in it for Him for his own glory and to demonstrate his power. And anytime the preacher or the people of God are not living according to his word, rather than being for his glory through them, his name is blasphemed. Churches need to be warned. People need to be warned. Your activity not only reflects upon you, it reflects upon God. So if you are in the world, stop it. If you are living for yourself, cease and turn back to Him in repentance and faith. And some of you who are young need to realize that in your youth, you're being carried by zeal. And some of it even might seem spiritual, but some of it is just being excited about what's around you. You need to know that when you get older and you get tired and bones hurt and the years pass, you're gonna need more than youthful zeal to cause you to walk with Him. And you're going to have to meet with this text at different times throughout your life. And you're going to need to hear this prophetic call. Stop it. Return to Him. Offer Him yourself. Some of you will probably experience great success in the ministry. Be careful. Men who experience great success, if they are not careful, often begin to see themselves as the spoiled rotten of God. That they can get away with things that other people cannot get away with because somehow they're treated differently. Also, they will stop going out to battle and begin to rest because they think they've won enough victories and they'll tarry at home when they should be in battle. You need to hear this over and over in your life. You belong to Him. And make sure that you are presenting yourself to Him. If you confront someone who is in sin, they will often say this, you can't judge a book by its cover. You confront someone in sin, they'll say, Yes, you are observe, observing my external actions, but you can't judge my heart. You don't know what's inside my heart. Paul has put this here as a remedy to this curse, to this type of thinking. The whole idea in the scripture is that if God has your heart, he has your body. There wasn't this separation in the scriptures. When he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's not trying to divide the human psyche. Hebrew thought of piling one term upon another. Why? To say, love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. You belong to Him. All of you to all of Him. It is not your life anymore. It is not your breath. It is not the beating of your heart. They're not your ears. They're not your eyes. They're not your lips. They're not your feet. They're not your hands. They all belong to Him. And everything is to be governed by him, his nature and his desires that he has revealed in his written word. See, so many young Christians today, they've got their ears pierced or they've got tattoos on their necks and things like that, telling the whole world somehow they're a slave of Christ. Away with all your stupid external things. That tells me nothing about your position before God. But poverty of spirit, mourning over sin, Rejoicing in Him, glorying in Christ, making much of Christ to all those around you. That tells me if you're a slave. Submitting to His will tells me you're a slave. Your actions tell me the content of your heart. If you can't be mesmerized with Christ to such an extent that you offer your life to Him here, how are you going to do it when you're alone in the mission field or in that very tough pastorate? 
offer yourselves to Him as a sacrifice. It's impossible to speak of sacrifice apart from speaking of loss. If you're truly going to walk with Him, there will be great loss. There will be death to self. There are so many things that will have to be cut out of your life in order that the great things, the superior things might be engrafted into your life. Cultivate that attitude so that as he reveals to you more and more of that which still belongs to you, you are ever willing to turn it over to him. You're constantly going to be telling them what they're supposed to do. But with that comes the urging. And with that comes the responsibility to tell them how to do it. You tell your congregation, you need to love God more. Well, how can you make yourself love God more? How can you make yourself more disposed to offering your life as a living sacrifice? The answer to that question is the primary task of the preacher. And what is that? The more the truly regenerate heart understands about the nature and works of God specifically revealed in the person and cross work of Jesus Christ, the more their heart is going to be inflamed with love. Now, make no mistake. You present these things to an unregenerate heart and the more knowledge they hear, the more they will hate God. But those who are truly Christian, a supernatural work of the spirit has been done to them, a work that is far superior and demonstrates more power than the very creation of the world because he created the world ex nihilo out of nothing. But when he converts a man, he takes a mass of rotten, corrupt humanity and turns it into a child of God. And that heart and that further work of providence ensures that the more that child learns about who God is and what God has done for them in Christ Jesus, the more their love will be drawn out of their hearts. Their desires for Christ will be inflamed and those desires will have an impact upon their will and drive them to holiness with joy. One of the reasons why I would submit to you that even converted hearts seem to be so apathetic today is that there is a lack of the knowledge of God. We have become a principle based many times, an ethical based type of Christianity instead of the preacher standing up and proclaiming the power and the glory and the superiority of God and the great work he's done in Christ. That is your task. Tell people who God is. And that's what Paul does. And then what does he do? He goes on and he tells them, what man is apart from the mercies of God. You see, in order to fully appreciate the nature, the person and the work of God on our behalf in Christ, we must understand what we were. You don't love God as you ought because you don't know how much you've been forgiven because no one ever told you how radically depraved you are. The more you truly know about the greatness and the power of God, the more you're going to lay aside all these silly ideas of church growth and church strategies and getting tattoos and wearing cool glasses and putting on dawning tight blue jeans. You're going to lay all that aside and you're going to realize that the kingdom of heaven is not built by little boys playing preacher because they're not willing to do the things that God has commanded in scripture, which is this, your weapons of warfare, they are the proclamation of truth, intercessory, bone jarring prayer and sacrificial love. And if you want some other weapon, don't come talk to me about missions. Now, what kind of men should you be? Will you go be alone with God? Will you make his habitation your dwelling place where no one else can go? And son, it is precarious. It is dangerous. You swing to and fro. You're there before God Almighty studying his word that you might speak it forth to his people. A great mantle, a great stewardship has been laid upon you. Carry it out with the greatest of caution, the greatest of joy, but the greatest of caution. This is your marvelous task. This is your terrible task. This must be your magnificent obsession. That while everyone is warm in their bed, you're in the watch night. You're alone with God. 
You learn to speak his language. You learn to hear his word. As you study it, you go down into the mine where no proud man goes. You swing to and fro. It's dangerous because you get into the word. You see your own heart revealed. Skin back as a prey that's been hunted. And you learn. You become something more than just a man. You become God's man. More than just an expositor. The one who speaks forth God's word. It will cost you everything. And instead of spending your life trying to figure out every new strategy that comes from some PhD student that's never done ministry. Instead of doing that, get yourself in your study. Mind God, know God, so that when you come out into the pulpit and you open up your mouth, the word of God comes out. Did you know what Spurgeon said? The Prince of Preachers, you listen to me, because if you do not learn this, all the other stuff you learn will not help you much. He said, I would rather teach one man to pray than teach 10 men to preach. Now, this came from one of the greatest of all preachers. What does this world need? We do not need more movers and shakers. We do not need more clever men. We do not need more strategies. There is more missionary activity on this planet right now than any time in the history of Christianity. And most of it is nothing more than smoke and mirrors. Because the task of the missionary is the same task of the pastor and vice versa. It is primarily to know God, to be before God, to study God's word, and then to go out and proclaim the word studied, to proclaim the God that is known. And this cannot be done just by the intellect. It must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not allow so many false prophets that exist today saying so many rude and blasphemous things against the Holy Spirit. Do not allow them to steal your inheritance. The only thing you can do, young man, of any good in the kingdom of heaven is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you must be men of prayer. Jesus did not ask you, he did not suggest to you that you pray at all times and not lose heart. He did not lay that down as a spiritual growth principle. He laid it down as a command. I beg you, to cultivate a life of study. I beg you to cultivate a life of prayer. God will work in your life to empty you, to break you, to show you that you can do absolutely nothing. Even in your brilliant expositions, you can do absolutely nothing unless the spirit of the living God is breathing through that place. It is the Spirit of God. What most fail to realize is that the Spirit of God is most promised to work among God's ministers when they are lashed down to the gospel. You are called to search out the most superior things and then give them to the people who hear you. And you are called upon to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And none of that will happen unless you are a man of prayer. The man who is used of God is the man who clings tenaciously to grace, clings tenaciously to Christ. Oh, I would pray that you would see your need so that you would grab a hold of the person of God in Christ, that you would depend wholly upon his good spirit that you would see your primary task as mining out the gold of the knowledge of God and of presenting it to God's people. What do we need on the mission field? Give me a man who spends the great portion of his morning in the study of God's word on his knees in prayer and then going out from there every day and proclaiming what he has discovered in the power that he has discovered of preaching faithfully God's word and ministering with a sacrificial love. The darkness that's out there is so terrifyingly great. If you ever look down the mouth of evil, it'll chew you up in a millisecond. You can do nothing against that. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, lashed to the word of God, 
proclaiming it in boldness and living in humility. Every mountain can be lifted up and cast into the sea. Do not hide behind the sovereignty of God. It is the sovereignty of God that tells us the kingdom can advance. The nations can know. So catch that vision and go.